start the, oh, I see you've already started the recording. All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, delighted to have uh, such a sizable group with us um, here the, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, depending on your, uh, your geographic location. Uh, this is the, uh, the third in what is now a uh, series of webinars uh, in connection with the forthcoming uh, edited volume on um, research on lifestyles uh, and sustainable, our, our handbook of research on sustainable lifestyles. Uh, I'm Maury Cohen. I'm one of the co-editors of the, of the book project. And um, um, I'm going to introduce my colleague, uh, Sylvia Lorek, in just a moment. But I did want to also announce that we have the next session in this series um, provisionally organized. Um, it's going to be held on um, um, Friday, May 3rd. We've had a little bit of jumping around date because of the May 1st holiday, which would normally be the day that we would probably do it. Uh, but the next session is going to feature uh, Magnus Bolstrom uh, and his colleagues um, uh, who um, uh, are contributing a chapter of the book on overcoming consumerism that will draw, um, I suspect, in significant measure on a recently published um, monograph that uh, that Magnus himself completed. Um, so um, again, delighted to have such a nice group here. Um, I'm going to pass the baton to uh, Sylvia and um, and uh, let her introduce our speaker for today. Sylvia, floor is yours. Welcome colleagues. We have the pleasure today to listen to Joachim Spangberg, who is a long-standing and outstanding member of the sustainability community. Uh, Joachim has a master on biology and ecology and a PhD on economics. And he published the first book, at least I have seen, on environment and the development in um, 1992. So, and since then he is working in science on sustainable consumption and other broader issues. Um, but he's also very engaged in civil society activities, among others at the moment still the in the scientific advisory board of Friends of the Earth um, Germany. And um, I'm also proud to say he is founder and honor honorably member, uh, no, president of the Sustainability Europe Research Institute, which I belong to um, as well. So, Joachim, we are listening to how you zoom into the Anthropocene and divide it into various perspectives. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, first of all, welcome everybody. And it's nice to have such a large group of mainly young uh, listeners. And uh, the plan is that we have enough time for discussion. And uh, please remember that there are no stupid questions. There are only stupid answers. And that's my duty. So uh, I'm in charge of that. Um, so that should work well. Um, yeah, if you saw me just disappear for a second from the screen, it was just uh, to fetch a cup of coffee because you know that the quality of a presentation is positively correlated to the level of coffee available. And uh, so that was it. And uh, last point, yes, Sylvia was right. I have been involved in sustainability issues for quite some time. You know that uh, the 1992 conference was based on the 1987 report, Our Common Future, which was uh, issued by the Brunt and Commission. And they had the office for our common future in uh, Switzerland. And I have been working with them since 1985. So even two years before the report came out. So probably uh, I can claim to be an early uh, engaged sustainability person. So that's it. Um, I would start my presentation now. Uh, if you don't have any questions to me directly, why I'm here, against whom, uh, I don't see any, so we can start the presentation. I hope it works.
Can you see it all? Is, is it fine? So yeah, Sylvia, Sylvia announced that uh, I divide the, the Anthropocene uh, uh, into different phases and uh, different ideological characterizations, the Populocene, the Technocene, and the Consumocene. Some people add the Capitalocene, but that was probably throughout. Um, why do we ask that question? The question is uh, simply that uh, technology and population and consumption all play a role, but we have to identify what are the indirect drivers, the driving forces behind the change, because otherwise we will not identify where prevention is most urgent. We have other fields where uh, pressures or direct drivers are acting, uh, where mitigation is needed, for example, when you have uh, damages um, or health problems due to climate change, you have biodiversity loss and you need restoration of ecosystems and things like that. And what we will need is a lot of adaptation. But what is important that we recognize and acknowledge what are the main driving forces, because only if we have them, then we can develop policies which are in the best sense of the word radical, because radical comes from the Latin word radix, which means the root, and radical policies means addressing the roots of the problems and not only curing the symptoms. So there is a long-standing debate, mainly in the US, that population is the number one driving force. If you look at this map, you see the countries where the population density is highest. And if that was true, then that should also be the regions which have the highest degree of devastation. That is the Himalayas, that is northern Egypt, this is the England, the Netherlands, Japan, South Korea, and uh, parts of uh, Indonesia and Mexico City. So if you look at that and look at what we know about the um, environmental impact and degradation that we see worldwide, these maps do not coincide. It appears obvious that population density it cannot be the main driving factor in the overall environmental degradation. Then maybe it's the population size then look at this map on the uh, lower axis, you find a number of biological or biophysical boundaries already transgressed. And you see it's going to up to seven out of the nine. And uh, then you see the uh, on the, on the uh, vertical, the number of uh, the, the social thresholds which have been achieved. What you can see here is two messages. One thing is the big circles are countries with a high population. And obviously, the level of uh, the, the size of population has no clear correlation to the number of uh, borders which have been transgressed. The second thing is a negative message. It is that while countries are developing, they tend to surpass different planetary boundaries, biophysical boundaries, and they do so faster than they achieve social success. So hoping to get social improvement by neglecting the environmental limitations is a probably failed undertaking. So that is uh, the issue about uh, population and Come on. If you look at people who say that uh, population is the number one factor, the conclusion is that we need less population to solve the environmental problems. However, since you are not just any people, but co-authors of this book, you are probably well aware that we only have one decade left to avoid a climate cat catastrophe, which means that we have to bring down the pressures within 10 years. 
And as population is as population growth is not the decisive factor for impact, but population size, this would mean we would have to reduce population size accordingly within a decade. And as we are across all the planetary boundaries, that would mean to reduce global population by 50 to 70 percent within the next 10 years. So how can we achieve that? I just see two ways. One is a global deadly pandemic and the other is a nuclear war. Both do not appear to be very sustainable solutions to our problems. So for two reasons, one reason population not being the key driver and secondly, for this, uh, secondly, um, no instruments available to reduce to, to, to tackle this factor, uh, population should not be the focus of our attention. Uh, a second long-standing discussion uh, is technology as a problem. That started in the U.S. also with Barry Commoner and in the early U.S. discourse, wrong technology was identified as being the main culprit of environmental degradation. It was, of course, disputed amongst uh, ecologists, but that was one factor which was very much dominating the public debate, that bad technology, inappropriate technology, was behind a lot of the environmental degradation we saw. And this is a picture from Germany, from the Ruhr area, from the roaring 60s. And you can imagine how beautiful the air must have been in those places. So there is some obvious support to the thesis, but the question is, is that the main driving force? In the meantime, the technology is playing, again, a crucial fact a crucial role in the discussion about sustainability but no no longer as a threat but as a solution so this is the hope that we can have all kinds of uh, technologies in processes of uh, global geoengineering which would help us and enable us uh, to eliminate the effects of increasing temperature by uh, big uh, mirrors in the sky, by whitening the clouds to reduce, uh, to, to enhance the uh, reflection of uh, solar radiation, and so forth and so forth. Uh, besides that, we also have the problems of uh, acidification of the oceans, which also would need a lot of limestone to put in the oceans, to put them back in place again. But in those cases as well, technological solutions are discussed at the hope we can have. The most recent discussion about technology solutions is about carbon capture and storage. We could capture all the carbon we admit into the atmosphere get it back and uh, bury it in the ground in the biggest uh, waste disposal sites the civilization has ever seen and hope that they stay there safely for the next two million years. Well, obviously, we will not be able to verify that promise because in two million years, hardly anybody will remember us. But still, that is what is the demand to those technologies. And as civil society, we are deeply skeptical that these are what we call techno fixes. Because they are no fixes of what is the driving forces. This is why I showed the graph in the beginning. Then uh, if the driving forces are different one, techno fixes will not solve our problems. The trust in technology is that it will be available in time uh, to solve the problems. Uh, you see this uh, wonderful, uh, promising activist uh, 
going towards the repair action. Below, you see the hope that technology and infrastructure will take us in their hands, a bridge from southern China. And the big picture is a past pipe dream. This was uh, from the former German colony in southwest Africa, now Namibia, where they hoped to solve all problems of fertility by developing one of the first that time very high-tech steam-powered plugging engine. Well, it turned out that uh, after half a day, the machine had used more water than they have available for a year, and that was not really addressing the driving forces of the problem. So the colonists put it on a little podium right here, said, thank you, Mr. Emperor, uh, thank you for this nice gift, and everybody can admire it here, but we don't use it. So hoping to solve problems with technology and then causing more problems than you have before is not a new phenomenon. And my personal guess is that 80% of the technologies we are looking for right now are sought for as remedies for earlier solutions by technological means for other problems. So we are perpetuating the circle. We are also uh, underestimating what nature can do. You know that nature can uh, store enormous amounts of carbon in wetlands, in forests, and in particular, also most often forgotten to mention, in uh, grassy areas, in grazing areas. So that is enormous carbon deposits and sinks for carbon. And economists hope that green taxes would help. Uh, right on the top, you see a famous economist uh, looking for evidence. Uh, because what we have seen so far, green taxes have never been enough to change the trajectory of emissions. So the conclusion is when you're re recognizing you're riding it at horse, dismount. And uh, this belief in technological solutions and green taxation is obviously a dead horse. <clears throat> but as I said in the very beginning, it's not only that uh, something is a solution or not. You must recognize what is the problems and you must acknowledge it. Otherwise, you will not find the right remediation. This is another nice uh, innovation. You may have heard about it, uh, how to save biodiversity in times of climate change. There is no copyright on the uh, original draft, so uh, the construction can be repeated. And that's what I said. The problem is not the problem as such. The problem is the attitude about the problem. If we would recognize what is the true problem, admit it and talk about it, then we might be able to address it. But as long as we are bound to work with tech, no fixes, or put the blame on population, we will not be able to do that. And now comes the very famous iPad formula. Those of you who haven't heard it, iPad is impact time. Impact is population times affluence times technology. Population is uh, a figure. Affluence is... Um, resource consumption per capita, and technology is uh, the resources, uh, something like that. Um, the point is, the iPad is a tautology, and that means it's a truism. It can never be wrong at any point in time. It's not a projection of a trajectory, but at any point in time, the impact on the environment is population times affluence times technology. So on, as we have seen already, population cannot be the main driving factor and it cannot be addressed in foreseeable time. 
there has been a study by Habal et al. who have been analyzing the weight of these different factors over the last about 80 years. And they found that in the second half of the previous century, indeed, the growth of population was a main driver of increasing impacts. And that changed at the turn of the millennium. And ever since, growing affluence measured as per capita consumption is the main driver of environmental impacts. Technology plays a slightly moderating role, but cannot compensate for the increases um, of affluence, which is of consumption. And we see that while IT and artificial intelligence in the first phase of application were increasing the efficiency of economies, they have become such an enormous growth sector that they are now driving energy and resource consumption in most industrialized countries. So it's a U-curve, first driving down the resource consumption by increasing efficiency, but then consuming themselves so much that uh, they are a driver of resource consumption and by that of environmental impacts. So also something we have to face and the reason that we have to think about not only about sufficiency in buying material goods, but you should also think about um, digital sufficiency. I said iPad is a truism and the fact is that we choose to believe that population is, is a problem and technology is a solution. This is a wrong choice. And it's done because we refuse to address what is the real reason, which is overconsumption. So we have to turn the perspectives around. So this one may be very convenient to live in, but it's not sustainable. So we have to turn the perspective and get the feedback on the ground to see what we can do to uh, really have a course-oriented policy approach. And please be aware, when we talk about sustainable consumption, it does not mean that everything is <clears throat> eco-friendly or recyclable, <clears throat> as long as the number of products is not limited, because they accumulate. So the challenge is not mainly unsustainable products. The challenge is mainly an unsustainable volume of products being consumed. Any kind of circular economy, which is uh, often uh, talked as a kind of solution, is indeed helpful, but not a solution as long as consumption growth continues or as long as consumption is not reduced to sustainable levels. To give some examples, uh, this is a nice figure from The Guardian. Of all mammals on Earth, 96% are livestock and humans. Just 60% are livestock. Only 4% are wild animals. It's figures I couldn't imagine before I saw them. Uh, <clears throat> the point is that we do not have to stop consuming uh, animal products or in particular products from cows for environmental reasons because, our, because grazing cows are a very important element of the Greenland ecosystem, which is, as I said, an important sink of carbon dioxide. So grazing cows, which are shitting in the landscape, uh, are actively contributing to soil improvement, uh, rural biodiversity, in particular uh, anthrop anthropod biodiversity, and by that to stabilizing both the quality of our soils, biodiversity, and the climate. However, as I said, grazing cows, 
This is not grazing cows. This is the cows which are too much. This is those we do not want to have, which are not sustainable, and we can get rid of them very easily. We just have not to become all vegans or vegetarians. It's enough if, in average, we eat 75% less meat. So, and every vegetarian is a kind of a license for the non-vegetarian to eat a bit more meat. So, all non-vegetarians should uh, celebrate vegans and vegetarians. And it's not only about the cows. If you look at the most frequent animals we have on the world, it's chicken and other poultry, which are 70% of all birds living on the planet. And uh, here again, uh, free-running birds, free-running uh, chicken are sometimes a problem because they uh, eat the larvae of other animals, uh, like, like uh, dragonflies. But uh, essentially, the point is we are mass-producing, including uh, medical treatment and health risks, uh, the animals, and in the end, uh, because we are the top of the predator chain, in the end, we are intoxicating ourselves. Uh, that is what we do to biodiversity. Everybody talks about climate. Biodiversity is an even more serious problem because that is where our nutrition depends upon. And that is what we do to it. So the only thing, the only option that we have, if you really want to have uh, any chance to address the problems, uh, the transgression of now seven planetary boundaries, we have to slim the put-put. You see here is the put-put system. On the one hand, there is input, which is being consumed and processed in the put-put system. And then you have output, which is partly usable for consumption and partly waste. So essentially what we need is we have to reduce the input to reduce the output to reduce the consumption, which means slimming the put-put. That is the big challenge that we have. Uh, you could also say we have to slim the physical throughput of the economy, but I find that slimming the put-put is easier to remember. And that cannot be done without addressing income distribution. Uh, on the bottom right side, you see uh, people shopping in Venice during the last flooding. And uh, you see in the upper right picture that now everybody is being infected by the <laughs> tendency to consume more and more. Uh, this is why uh, in The Guardian they have named these people who have a lot of money which they uh, invest in uh, dirty, polluting industries and unsustainable consumption. Those are the plutocrats. It's not plutocrats anymore, it's pollutocrats now. Or the rich and the dirty, you could say. And that is a lifestyle we simply can no longer afford because that is ruining the uh, basic conditions for survival for too many people around the world. From a liberal point of view, it's very important to be aware that sometimes it is indispensable to limit the freedom of a few people to safeguard the freedom of all people. Uh, limit the freedom of overconsumption of a few people to safeguard the conditions of living for all is a deeply liberal idea because liberalism addresses the quality of life and um, the utility of the majority and not only of a privileged minority. So we must get away from a situation where overconsumption is considered an entitlement, whereas, in fact, it is a privilege which is enjoyed at the expense of others. 
that means that we have to take about redistribution as an element of sustainable consumption. And that means also that the philosoph philosophical basis of more and more needs to be rethought. The post on the light uh, took a photo in the London Underground. It was put there by the Major of London. He wants a little bit more than he'll ever get. Probably Sadiq Khan is a bit sad that he's never going to be Prime Minister. But uh, why everybody should join that is not that clear. But it's hard to escape the, or well, hard to accept the demands uh, if you have the promises of tech no fixes, because when the lies are exactly what you wanted to hear, it's hard to accept the truth. And that makes uh, tech no fixes so dangerous. But we also have to talk about the value system behind. There is a value confusion. Uh, on the top right hand, you see uh, that someone considers that love can be transferred by Western Union. Obviously, love can be expressed in dollars. If that is true, uh, I'm going to buy me a bit more. Uh, that is uh, a clear misinterpretation of values. Uh, below that, you see uh, that you can buy happiness even in bottles at uh, decent prices. It's um, Philippine pesos. Guess who... Uh, who sells happiness in bottles? Any idea? Any anybody's suggestion? Have you ever bought happiness in a bottle? Coke? Of course. Coca-Cola. So happiness in a bottle, uh well. That is also a kind of confusion of happiness and consumption. And on the left-hand side, you see the cartoon, which uh, says that for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for our shareholders, which was uh, the immediate objective. Uh, and the price to be paid later on didn't matter that much. So the short-termism and the uh, defense of privileges are key factors which stand in the way of a turn in sustainable towards sustainable consumption. And that means uh, we cannot follow the mainstream, but truth and beauty are, as you see on the bike lane on the left, and that implies that this lonely biker will not change the world, but we have to set examples and we have to talk about them and demonstrate them and show them to make sure that others see it and can and can follow. Because I'm deeply convinced that a better life is possible than just to work, buy, consume, and die. Huh? And this is the end of this presentation. And uh, I would be happy to discuss with you about uh, what I've said and uh, what you've seen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joachim. So I was having an eye on the chat, uh, besides that some guests were on Coke and but also on the cosmetic industry, on liquor and beer. <laughs> uh, regarding the happiness, uh, there is fortunately not too much uh, to follow up. So we can, oh, we can go for questions directly by raising hands. Good. I, I'm, then, 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 I'm, then I'm kicking off. Um, you ask, if, I'm, if I got you right, when I saw the title of the presentation, I was somehow guessing, uh, expecting you would, would do a share. So how much is Technocene? How much is uh, 
what was it, the consumer scene? No, an unpopular scene. But you say it's definitely not population and technology, it is the consumption, right? Yeah, I said that uh, in the last century, population growth was a driver of environmental destruction, mainly um, because there was a high population growth in, in China and India. And um, since the turn of the century, the main driver is increasing per capita consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, not the number of capita growing, but the consumption per capita growing is the main driving force ever since. Again, China is one of the main factors because they have been managing to lift a billion people out of poverty, which is not a bad idea. But I think what we would need is to be aware how it is being done. Is it by consumption or is it by other means? Um, just to mention another concept, which is about needs and satisfiers. Uh, is everybody familiar with that? I would guess yes, but I uh, sometimes I'm surprised how many people are not. Yeah. Okay. So the point is that, of course, uh, in sustainable consumption, we do respect and must respect human needs. But economists tell us human needs are infinite, and that is nonsense. The point is that human needs, from a psychological and social point of view, are rather universal and limited in number. But what is infinite is the number of potential satisfiers for the need. So if you need, if you have a need for being, uh, to have shelter, uh, that can be fulfilled by uh, buying a house. For some billionaires, it must be a bunker now. And uh, in many other cases, by being a member of a group which supports you, to be taken into the arm by someone who wants to help you. So there are very many things, uh, not all, of course, like food and clothing and so on you need, but there are very many things like appreciation, uh, like uh, self-realization and so forth, which are much better fulfilled by social processes than by buying commercial goods. And that means that while the number of satisfiers is infinite, the number of needs is limited, and sustainable consumption is all about finding resource light or sustainable satisfiers for human needs. It is not about ignoring human needs, but finding the right satisfiers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, Ariel has raised the point. He has a question in the chat, Maury, because that's why Ariel is first. Hi. Um, yeah. Um, quick question. Um, I can hear the economist saying, you know, you need growth and you need consumption to create jobs. Um, what would your answer to that be? I mean, the, the whole system we have is based on that. If you don't have growth, you don't have higher income, you don't have job creation, um, you know, less consumption is less growth, less jobs. What's what's the answer to that, in your opinion? Well, that's absolutely true, but only if you accept that for now and all future, shortening the working hours and redistribution of income is a taboo and must not be discussed about. You see, until um, the 1990s, we had a regular tendency in most industrialized countries for decreasing working hours. They went down from 90 hours a week to 37 hours a week in Germany. This is why we have such a poor GDP, by the way, because we work a quarter less working hours than the average US worker. Uh, so there is a preference for, for leisure time in, in some European countries. But the point is that uh, under the neoliberal policy and under neoclassical economics, this was made a complete taboo issue and it was stopped. 
And then, of course, if you just do not talk about that option, then you have a much stronger correlation between uh, job creation, income, and uh, economic growth. Yeah. By the uh, way, uh, yeah. most, of current, most of current work is being done unpaid. If you look at the GDP, uh, you can see that we have According, I only have the German figures in mind that about 120 percent that the volume of unpaid work is about 100 percent, 120 percent of the volume of paid work. So, uh, because it's usually done in, in sectors which have a lower average salary, we could increase our GDP in one day by about 85 percent. If we would just take into account the value created by unpaid work. So that's that's about my trust in these figures. Which is a question we discuss another time. <laughs> Maury. So Joachim, thank you. Um, and um, there's hardly anything here that I disagree with you about. Um, but um, in your earlier response, you mentioned taboos. And um, I find it useful from time to time to go back and look at first principles like you've done here to um, revert back to um, uh, constructs like the iPad equation from 40 or so years ago. Um, and uh, as the sort of discourse on sustainable consumption has been been built up um, really ever since um, since uh, since Agenda 21 in 1992, and in particular Chapter 4 of Agenda 21, which may be a, a dusty old document for some of the folks gathered here today. Um, so maybe this is a little bit of a history lesson. Um, so, um, and many of us have, have been part of, of that conversation since, um, since uh, since Rio in, in 1992. Um, but the, the, the population question seems to be a, a sort of a zombie that, you know, no matter how much it's discredited and uh, empirically um, uh, 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 undermined as you've effectively done here today, it, it, it never dies. Um, and I'm wondering whether from your vantage point, we've been perhaps too um, reluctant out of a sense of perhaps political correctness to take the population question on more forcefully and to really try to put a, a dagger in the heart of what has become a, an argument that just seems to be so per persistent um, and seemingly never goes away. Well, population, of course, is in Germany uh, a hot issue due to, hi due to historical reasons. Much of the argumentation why population is an important issue uh, is in line with arguments from the Nazi government. And this is why probably in our region there has been very reluctance to talk about it. But uh, I think uh, saying that if you want to solve the world by reducing the world population requires a nuclear war is something uh, you couldn't be much clearer about it. So I hope that's uh, cl clear enough. I mean, I'll just sort of I'll make one final observation. I mean, even in the context of this book project, the issue of population has from my perspective, rather unfortunately, begun to kind of creep in through some of the seams. Um, and so again, even within, um, I think a fellowship of relatively like-minded people, um, population, again, um, it just, it, it never it never goes away. <laughs> um, and, um, um, sort of at the, 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 the long-standing heart of environmental discussions going back at least as far as Malthus, um, uh, that um, and maybe we need to have a more comprehensive strategy among ourselves as to how we talk about population rather than kind of 
pushing it under the covers as I think uh, there's been a tendency to do. I don't want this to turn into a conversation about populations. I'll just stop there and just sort of let that well, just, sit. Just, just uh, again, the question is why does population pop up again and again? And uh, I think uh, the discussion about population is very strong in the US and comes back again, even in US and Canada, and comes back again and again. Uh, even in like-minded circles, which drives me crazy. Uh, it's much less of an issue in Europe. But uh, if you make population the culprit, then consumption isn't the culprit. And that means, uh, I remember when George Bush, the one without the W, uh, was... Uh, talking uh, to the Rio conference and uh, co preparation and said, the American way of life is not up for discussion, full stop. And if you talk about, if you do not talk about population, then the American way is very much so up for discussion. And I think that is the main taboo we have to break because then we can show that you don't need excuses because talking about population shifts the responsibility for global degradation from highly consuming countries to the world's poor. And that is not only wrong, but also very unfair. And uh, the poor are those who cannot help themselves. And I had those discussions several times. I think we have to really address this kind of um, issue. And then uh, maybe one more anecdote. We wrote a study about sustainable Europe and I was invited by um, the parliamentarians uh, for sustainability and I had to the chance to give a presentation on Capitol Hill some 40 years ago. Uh, and then one senator came up to me and said, uh, this will never fly in the US. And I said, why? And I said, how can we talk about more justice in distribution in the world without mentioning the justice of distribution in our country? This will never take hold. Well, 40 years is a long time, but uh, I think it's high time that this discussion is being dared to take. And... Uh, I think we as scientists and civil society people, we are the ones who have, do not have to win elections. So we do not have to say what is pleasing people. We can say what is fact. We can talk about realities. And even if uh, doomsday prophets never get elected, we don't have to get elected. We just have to fight to save the world. And uh, I think uh, if they hit us, that's the usual political process. First, they hit the first messengers until the first storm is over, and only then politicians dare to come out and support the idea. Well, let them hit us, and let them swear at us, and make it possible to make this an issue of the public debate so that well-meaning politicians can pick it up and go for the change that we urgently need. Thank you very much. This is encouraging also in the messages I, I have to give to my students. So, Brioni. Brioni, <laughs> whatever your name is pronounced. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Hello. I'm just unmuting myself and everything. Hi. Um, thank you. That was really interesting and also very entertaining presentation. Um, I had a couple of comments and I think you were kind of like getting at the comments in your last answer. Um, but I was thinking that with the way you've it feels like you separated, at least in the presentation, uh, consumption from technology kind of quite completely. And I wondered if that meant you might give the impression that um, technology doesn't also kind of influence the, the consumption that people engage in. Um, and it also might suggest that the responsibility for addressing consumption, I mean, you've obviously talked about income redistribution, but the responsibility is quite a lot with um, for unsustainable consumption is with individuals who are quite wealthy and therefore kind of quite you know, have quite a lot of agency or, or sort of power to do something about that. And I guess kind of like quite a well 
rehearsed, I suppose, argument along these lines is, um, with car-based transport and how, like, you know, obviously that's a system that's kind of a technological or material system that's developed that's made people dependent on it. And if you think about things like the Gilets Jones protests in France, where you could say that, um, obviously it's, it's relative to very high consumption, but I think it could still be considered like problematic environmentally being very dependent on cars, but then that was targeting people who actually kind of working people with not very high incomes and not much ability to um, change that, those consumption patterns. Um, so I just wondered what you thought about that and if it's something you're kind of unpicking a bit more um, in the book chapter than I, or maybe I just didn't pick up on all the subtleties, but like than I thought I saw in the presentation. Well, maybe I didn't get all of your question, but um, when you refer to the Yellow Vest in France, the point was that they had a justified feeling of injustice because their life situation wasn't taken into account. So when we talk about a systemic change, we must be aware that this systemic change has two difficulties. One difficulty is that uh, every such transition has winners and losers. And on the one hand side, you have losers which are powerful industrial interests. They will fight us with everything that they have. But on the other hand, it will also be a burden, in particular on low income people. And that means we have a second reason to talk about the redistribution of income and the possibilities of guaranteeing a decent life. When we talked about sustainability, we always said that uh, it's a matter of limitations, but we need an upper and a lower limit. An upper limit for overconsumption, but also a lower limit against underconsumption. And uh, that means people must have enough resources available to be able to live a decent life. And uh, the question is, how much is that? It's different between societies. You cannot name absolute figures. But it's essential that this is guaranteed and not something uh, where you do not know whether you will have enough tomorrow. Because uncertainty is one of the biggest uh, threats in our current times. So we must offer people certainty about the ability to form their own lives in a decent way within certain boundaries. So that is uh, something which is often forgotten in the sustainable consumption discussion. Poverty and hunger is definitely not a sustainable consumption pattern. And I remember when I was invited by the Development Bank of Southern Africa, I talked to them about uh, the limitations and they said, yeah, we have some high consumers, we could think about some measures maybe higher taxes and things like that. I said, yeah, but it's not only about overconsumption, it's also about underconsumption, combating poverty. And they looked at me and said, uh, underconsumption? Uh, do you want to start a revolution? And I looked at them and said, is that necessary? And that was the end of our sens sens sensitive uh, discussion. Because uh, you know how bankers are, they are not amongst those who are the poor sector of society. So that is a kind of a challenge that you have. But I'm deeply convinced, uh, I'm absolutely sure that uh, we need a great transition. And this transition will be social or it will not be. Was that at least partly an answer to your question? Yes, I, I think I was muted, maybe because I was talking too much. So I probably shouldn't say much more, but yeah, that, that partly answers the question. Thank you. You still have four minutes. Yeah, uh, I'm just, uh, people are asking for the slides. I just informed them that we have the presentation recorded. So it is on the website. What is about the presentation? Do we get it? Shall we share it, Joachim? Would that be uh, I've, I've uploaded it on the um, research gate, but oh, as you re remember that uh, most of the pictures and many pictures are copyright protected, 
it's a pretty empty presentation. So look at the presentation on the screen. Uh, it's much more convenient. Yeah. So as you Achim said, we have less than five minutes, four minutes left. I would I would ask for one more question with a with a short answer, or we can close. Who any any and and any brave person to raise their hand? Otherwise, I would like to thank you very much again. So the feedback we got was entertaining. Yeah. And informative, as we have seen from the discussions. Which well, came me, up. Let me also thank you very much for the discussion, for your presence here, and for the interesting questions. Uh, if you have more questions, I think uh, the editors of the book and uh, the senior team will be happy to discuss with you. And uh, what is regarding my work, if you look at my uh, address at Academia or at ResearchGate, Whatever I have written and presented is available for free download. If it's not copyright protected, in that case, you just click a link and I send it to you. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, have a good afternoon or whatever time of day you have. <laughs> bye bye, Joachim. Thank you. Everybody. Bye. Bye bye. And bye bye to our guests. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, Edina. Bye. 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 Bye.